ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and those who don't identify as either. You are listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. I guess I'm supposed to be watching the royal funeral because the world is supposed to care. I feel bad for the actual royal family. I can empathize with them that someone's mother, grandmother, great-grandmother has passed away. And that is a very devastating and emotionally harrowing time. But just as a, you know, non-citizen of the UK, I just... I didn't even tune in to see Megan's outfit. I went online and, and searched for pictures because that's all I really cared about is what Megan was wearing. I did not disappoint. I just put up a post on my Instagram showing Megan. She has it all black like everybody else, but she has this hat. The hat is at an old nasty black girl tilt. It's like some mahogany, Diana Ross, the boss, Miss Ross type era. She's serving in this black hat. I know we probably shouldn't critique funeral attire. But I'm going to. I'm going to. She also has on a cape, like a goddamn superhero. And I was like, the hell these people have been giving her over in the UK for no damn reason. She came through. Megan, say what you want about her. People love her. People hate her. People don't ever feel indifferent. She inspires something in people when they see her, which is, you know, a talent within itself. Everyone can inspire something in others or anyone. It's a talent. But the cape and the hat, madam. The Duchess, she is excellent at fashion diplomacy. It's a very real thing. Essentially showing up stunting so people have to acknowledge you in the room and make an assessment of of who the fuck you are, what everything from your jewelry to your outfit choices mean, and who you are channeling when you show up dressed. It's a thing. I like to say for Megan, I think I started saying this the first time she went back to the UK after she and Harry left. They did a series of very bourgeois events. One of them, I think, was an opera. But Megan showed up in these gowns. And I was like, baby, that's what inspired the line. Release the fabric. I feel like that's what Megan does when she shows up someplace, especially when she knows she's not welcome or wanted. She just shows up and stunts on mofos. Release the fabric. That's the fancy way of stunt on a motherfucker. Yes, she does that very well. But other than looking for the pictures of Megan, I haven't watched anything related to the royal funeral. I don't care. I'm sorry. I don't mean no disrespect to the lady. I just, I, I don't, I don't care. And also, give India and South Africa their diamonds back while we're on the subject. Speaking of colonialism, which I didn't directly mention, but I alluded to, I was riding around the other day. I was coming from the art center. I have a very special guest that is allegedly visiting my house on Saturday. So I've been trying to spruce it up and I wanted to get some statues and some art just to, you know, give the place something lively for my guests to see. I cannot tell you who it is. I wish I could. But I went to the art center looking for inexpensive art, which I didn't find the piece that I wanted. So I have to go to the Artist Alliance and pay top dollar, which I was trying to avoid. But I want what I want, so I'm going to have to pay a little bag for it. Not a big bag, but a little bag. But I was on my way back to my apartment, and traffic was backed up. Saturday, at this time of year in Accra, is funeral day. We, I told you about the funerals here before, which, like, somebody dies. In America, like, if somebody dies on a Saturday, you got to get them in the ground within seven days before people start talking about why the body left out so long. Not so much here. If somebody dies, then you got to send out the announcement And you got to alert people who may be living abroad to give them time to come home. You have to raise money for the funeral because it's not just like, you know, you put somebody in a casket, you put them in the ground. Like the funeral is an event. There may be a host for your funeral. It's it's not just a, a single day event. There's not like, oh, there's a wake and then there's a funeral and then there's a repast all in one day. It's a lot more to it in the way they celebrate here. The streets were were crowded like there was the traffic was backed up. Because the number of funerals in Accra, it should have taken me like 15 minutes to get home. It took me 45 because of the number of funerals and, you know, cars lining the streets and people crossing the streets. I saw at least four just on the ride to get home. Tons of people in red and black and lots of music. Funerals here tend to be celebratory events. It's not the morning that we're accustomed to. It's a little more second line from New Orleans than it is than it is elsewhere. The the funerals that I've seen so far have not been somber occasions. One of my friends also told me, he was like, yeah, you know, the funeral is where you go to find a spouse. I said, excuse me, the funeral 
And he said, yeah. I said, not the wedding. He said, no, nah, because if you attach to somebody, you know, you take your somebody to, to, the, to a wedding. You might be attached to somebody, but you're not really sure. You go to the funeral to see who else is available. I said, the funeral? He said, yeah. He said, my mother died. He said, so many women hit on me at the funeral. He said, and he said, it's my culture. He said, I was offended, though. I was like, my mother just died. You trying to make me your husband? I said, did you take some numbers? He said, I did. I said, sir, sir, sir. He said, it's a funeral. It's cultural. What you want me to do? He still ain't married, though. He's engaged once. Funerals, from my observation, everybody's in red and black, and everyone is very celebratory. If, and if single, looking for a spouse. I was like, the funeral, you say? That's not the point. The point is, I drove by this mural, and it was Holly Celeste, Bob Marley, and Marcus Garvey. And I keep seeing images of Marcus Garvey all over Ghana. I don't think it's coincidental that Ghana's Independence Plaza or the Ark that it's very well known for has a black star at the top. It's called Black Star Plaza. It was named such in, in like the 60s. It's like that's 40 years after Marcus Garvey had his black star line for his ships. I was like, there's got to be a connection there, especially with the prevalence in which I see Marcus Garvey all over Ghana. So given how like I thought I knew something about colonialism and then realized I didn't know shit. I've been questioning everything. So I was like, you know what? Let me watch a documentary on Marcus Garvey and see what his ties are to Ghana. Maybe I watched the wrong documentary. So far, I'm like, Marcus Garvey's ties were to Liberia. But Marcus Garvey was really big on Pan-Africanism, which, you know, the first president of Ghana was very big on Pan-Africanism. Holly Celeste, same thing, Pan-Africanism. So I was like, okay, so that's why Marcus Garvey is so popular here. But watching this documentary, I learned so much about Marcus Garvey that I thought I knew but didn't. My understanding of Marcus Garvey was, yes, Pan-Africanism was, yes, back to Africa. And yes, I knew about the ships. I thought Marcus Garvey had the Black Star line of ships and he got a bunch of black people in America to get on the ships and took them back to Africa. You know, Marcus Garvey never made it to Africa. Tried, but never made it. And his destination in Africa wasn't Ghana, but it was to go to Liberia. I was like, why does Ghana love Marcus Garvey so much again? Because he wasn't trying to come here. He was trying to go like two doors down. But I guess West Africa, it's all like on the same coast, maybe. I don't know. Also, I knew Marcus Garvey got deported. I didn't know it was because of mail fraud. J. Edgar Hoover, the same J. Edgar Hoover who went after Martin Luther King, also went after Marcus Garvey. And I had to check the dates. I was like, how long was this mofo working at the FBI? Forever. I have no idea what the name of the documentary is. I just pulled a documentary up on YouTube. It looks like something from the 80s based on the clothing and the hairstyles of the historians. It was two hours and 20 minutes. It was very fascinating. But I watched like the documentary and the whole time I was watching and thinking about like how Marcus Garvey becomes Marcus Garvey. He starts his organization in Jamaica and it really doesn't take hold there, mostly because of his personality, according to the documentary and some sketchy accounting. So then he moves to Harlem and he tries to start all over again, but he's not a very eloquent speaker. The first time he literally falls on his face, he falls off the stage. But then he starts following this white evangelical pastor that was really big at the time. And he adopts his way of preaching as his way of speaking. And then he adds in the pageantry of, you know, like the military uniforms and such like that. Like he gives black pride ceremony is not the right word ritual. But so the whole time I'm watching this documentary, I was like, this looks so suspiciously like the nation of Islam. I was like, I don't think you get a nation of Islam without Marcus Garvey. And I'm not even thinking about the message of it. I'm thinking about the marketing of it because message is one thing. Marketing is another. You don't get the message out without the marketing. So the end of the Marcus Garvey documentary, it goes through, you know, his deportation, his return to Jamaica. Um, He tried several businesses there. They all failed, basically. And he dies in ruin. The last part of the documentary is talking about the influence. They start talking about this family called the Littles who moved to Lansing, Michigan. The Littles were very devoted Garveyites, like many black people. Like Marcus Garvey raised a ton of money just marketing to black people. Even folks were just sending like five cents out of their paycheck, which five cents went a lot further then than it does now. But he racked up like hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy like, you know, a small fleet of ships with black folks money. That said, the Littles 
in Lansing. They have a bunch of kids. One of them is named Malcolm. And I was like, oh, I wasn't that far off with the Nation of Islam thing. So I mentioned this on like my Facebook page. And one of my friends was like, yeah, there was like the Garveyites. And then there was like Father Divine. And I was like, who? So now I'm going down the rabbit hole on Father Divine because I have no idea who that is. I've never heard of Father Divine. But he was like, yeah, I wrote my thesis on like Marcus Garvey and, and Father Divine. They were contemporaries and they like clashed. And I was like, what? You know who else clashed with Marcus Garvey? W.E.B. Du Bois. He took that talented tenth like bougie shit to a whole nother level. Like, I think sometimes people don't realize, like, the, um, the respectability or classism of W.E.B. Du Bois. Like, I mean, they hear the Talented Tenth, and I don't think they fully realize, like, how, um, how elitist and, and separatist he was with that. He had some good ideas, but the man was, like, elitist as fuck. One of Garvey's biggest detractors was W.E.B. Du Bois, who thought he was like a a buffoon and was like, basically, get out of here with that back to Africa shit. I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that's what it boiled down to. But one of the reasons the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, felt so comfortable going after Marcus Garvey was because respected black leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois and um, A. Philip Randolph. But they were very outspoken against Marcus Garvey. One of the reasons why the FBI felt comfortable going after him, because they were like, he doesn't even have the, the faith of other black leaders. So, you know, he's an easy target. So mail fraud is what they got him for. I mean, he, he had his own fuck ups, like to be clear. But mail fraud is essentially what he got taken down for. He, he was sentenced to five years in prison for mail fraud, but he had bad health and they didn't want him to die in prison and look like a martyr and look like, and look like the U.S. government killed him. So they let him out of jail early and sent him back to Jamaica and banned him from coming back to the U.S. Fascinating shit. It debunks everything that I thought I knew about Marcus Garvey. Like, I had the basics. Like, I got the Black Star. I got the ships. I got the back to Africa, like I said earlier. But I really thought that he, like, had gone back to Africa at some point. Like, I know he didn't stay there, but I thought he at least went there. But I was like, he had this whole movement about going back to Africa and had literally, literally never been to Africa. It was all theoretical about what Africa was or could be. And he wanted to take black folks back there. And I was like, you know, I've been here so I could testify. Like, it's cool. Come. It's fine. Like, this move is the fifth time I've been to Ghana, but the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth time I've come to the continent. South Africa twice, Kenya, Morocco, four times before I moved here. So nine. So I could testify that, you know, like, everything's fine. Like, you can pack up your shit and come. I would rather somebody who had been tell me, like, okay, let's go, as opposed to somebody who ain't never been. You ever been on a trip with something? Actually, I'm not even going to go down that road because it's going to come across as shady. I'm just going to skip that. Next topic. (laughs) So much going on in the world. There is good black news. Yara Shahidi is going to be playing Tinkerbell. And then her. She's supposed to be performing at Global Citizen. I heard she's not going to make it. But her is going to star in the live action version of Beauty and the Beast. It's supposed to air on ABC. But her is going to be Belle. So the beauty... Her. Black girl. Her. Tinkerbell. Black. Yara. I don't know what they over there drinking at Disney. Who high up at Disney has been watching like a bunch of CB4 and reading like the Black Panther 10 point plan? I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it at all. Like Disney had princesses for a good 70 years before they made a black one. I'm not mad. I just want to know the backstory on how all of a sudden everybody's black. Again, not upset applauding, happy about it, want to see all the black princesses and black fairies. Like, you can make everybody black. I'm totally fine with it. I just want to know the backstory on how it happened. Because, like, all of a sudden, everybody's black. You got one black princess in all these years. Now, all of a sudden, there's, like, a black Ariel, a black Tinkerbell, and a black beauty. Not mad. Just curious. And thankful, to be clear. And other good black news, these pictures have been circulating. I don't know where they came from. One of my friends said they're from a Tiffany ad. They're of the darling known as Isaiah Wade. Dwayne Wade's daughter, she's gorgeous. I don't know where these pictures came from. They're just all over my timeline and I can't figure out like the original source. She's giving delicate brown beauty, like the face of an angel. The same way I talked about Halle Bailey looking like the little face of an angel. In the Little Mermaid trailer, Zaya is gorgeous. Absolutely. 
I think for the last couple of years, she's been in like a little awkward phase where she's trying to figure out what her look is, which is very age appropriate. Like we all went through it, self included, but she settled on her, her look. She just, she's so pretty. I am so thankful for the example that Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union have set in their support of their trans kid. Because we hear so many horror stories about trans people in general, but teens especially. Teenage hormones and all that angst are just a bad combination without having to navigate a trans experience. But Zaya Wade is turning out to be an amazing example of what's possible when you just love and support your kid. And I'm making all these um, assumptions, really. Let me be clear about what I'm doing. Assumptions based on pictures. But you know, they say pictures are worth a thousand words. But Zaya looks like she's flourishing. She looks, she looks peaceful. She looks happy. She looks loved. She looks comfortable. She looks like she's accepted herself. And I think especially as a teenager... You know, acceptance is hard to come by, but it's so much easier when the people around you are accepting of who you are. So kudos to D-Wade and Gabby. Zaya is flourishing. Um, I wish every trans kid had that experience of just being accepted, loved, supported, all that. If you haven't seen the pictures of Zaya, I'll post them along with the, um, with the announcement of this, of this episode of Ratchet and Respectable. Feeling your best starts with what you eat. Sakara helps you live a healthy, balanced lifestyle and truly enjoy it with delicious, plant-rich, transformational nutrition that builds a foundation for living in your best body. Sakara is a wellness company anchored in food as medicine on a mission to nourish your body through the power of plants. Sakara gives you the tools you need to transform your life with their organic ready-to-eat meal delivery program and functional wellness essentials. Their nutritionally designed chef-crafted breakfasts, lunches, and dinners are made with powerful plant-rich ingredients, helping boost your energy, support your digestion, curb your sugar cravings, and my favorite part, get your skin glowing. Plus, it's all delivered right to your door, ready to eat. And right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash ratchet or enter code ratchet at checkout. That's Sakara, S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash ratchet to get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash ratchet. So much good black news this week. Did you see Cheryl Lee Ralph has been receiving flowers? Cheryl Lee Ralph and this Emmy win is the gift that keeps on giving. Celebrating Cheryl Lee Ralph is its own video genre on social media right now. And her kids are so damn supportive. I didn't mention them in a previous episode. There was a video when Cheryl Lee Ralph was winning the actual Emmy, when her name was called, her children weren't sitting at the table with her. They were up really like in the rafters. It was only the actors, probably the producers and network execs that were sitting at the actual table with Cheryl Lee Ralph. But her children were there. They were up in the stands. And when she won, they lost their goddamn mind. Like they were screaming and yelling like they had won a goddamn Emmy. And I was like, if your mom wins one, it's one for the family. Like the whole family just won an Emmy. But they were screaming and yelling and going crazy. And I was like, yo, I don't have kids, right? If I had kids and I got a big award and my kids didn't go crazy like that, I was like, you know what? They need to be disowned. Cut off the inheritance. They're not worthy. Her kids are like the best. I love Cheryl Lee Ralph's kids as much as I love her. Like they, they are so excited about their mother. And I was like, this is the way it should be. But people have been sending flowers to Cheryl Lee Ralph. And I told you, I get like secondhand joy. So I've just been over the moon watching Cheryl Lee Ralph be overwhelmed with joy of people who are celebrating her. I was like, it's long overdue. So now that it's here, like go big or go home. Oprah sent this gigantic bouquet to her. I don't even know how many flowers that was. It was more than four dozen. I would say it was probably more like 10 dozen. It, it took two grown men 
to to carry it out of the back of the truck and up the driveway and they were struggling like it was a gigantic bouquet of roses so beautiful so absolutely beautiful and then she got roses from Beyonce which led everyone to believe like how does Beyonce get all these people's addresses Beyonce just be sending stuff to a little bit of everybody I'm like how is she getting these addresses are the rest of us secure where is B tapping into to get everyone's address she be sending out Ivy Park to everybody. She sends out flowers to everybody, invites to everybody. Where is Beyonce getting these addresses from? But Cheryl Lee Ralph was over the moon. She was like, Beyonce, Beyonce sent me flowers. And I'm like, yes, you are the Cheryl Lee Ralph. The Cheryl Lee Ralph. Your dream girls. It all comes together, full circle. I love it. In the last of our good black news, the woman king. We talked about it last week. I didn't do a review because I didn't want to give anything away. I saw The Woman King the day before it dropped. So I didn't want to give anything away because I realized most people don't have access to screeners or we're going to go that weekend. So I wanted to give nothing away. The Woman King was projected to do 15 million for opening weekend. It did 19. So it did better than projections, which I'm very, very pleased about. I think it could have even done better if it wasn't battling a lot of misinformation and also just bullshit. I talked about the misinformation part last week because I had read a lot of commentary, think pieces, even before the film came out, just based on the trailer or just based on on expectations that weren't accurate. But a lot of people were saying that the Dahomey tribe, which the woman king is based on, that they were participants in the slave trade in Africa, that they were black people who sold other black people, which is true. But they were saying that the film whitewashes that and presents these warriors as heroes and pretends that the slave trade doesn't exist. And so last week I made a point to note that the slave trade is a central part of the conflict in the film. I also read where there was a boycott, boycott uh, Woman King was a, a popular hashtag on Twitter. I don't know if it was trending based on the number of think pieces and, and of larger sites that were talking about the Woman King and just reading the responses. There were a lot of I almost hesitate to call them men, but I guess that's the, the actual description for them without being disrespectful. Uh, but a lot of guys who seemed like they were followers of the cult leader had a lot to say about the woman king, sight unseen. So their issues were with these black women being shown as warriors, being seen as strong. They said that that was emasculating to black men, that that was detrimental to the image of black women because black women are already not seen as feminine or black women are already quote unquote too masculine. And so this is part of a Hollywood agenda to further destroy and disrupt the black family, which I was like, really? And then also there was just an issue with the title Woman King, the idea that a woman could be labeled king. And I was like, God damn it. If you just saw the film, you would understand where where that name, that specific title came from. And without giving anything from the film away, if you haven't seen it, essentially, it just means that she's equal to the king. It doesn't mean that she she replaces the king, that she's more powerful than the king, that the king is, is lesser than the woman king is really just a title that says that a particular woman is is equal to the king, which, you know, to me sounds ideal, the, the idea of equality. But, you know, the followers of the cult leader are not interested in equality. They're interested in subservience, essentially. They, they think that there is um, a particular role for women and that role is beneath a man that she's that she submits to a man's leadership, which the funny thing about this film, I shouldn't say the funny thing, maybe the ironic thing is about what they're, you know, boohooing and belly aching about this film and, and men's roles or, or lack of leadership or emasculation. I'm like, for all of these very strong women that are defending this kingdom they're all doing such in service to the king. 
John Boyega is the king in the film, and he's a good king, more or less. He's not perfect. He has his flaws, but he does strive to be like genuinely a good king. But all of the all of the the soldiers, all of the women, in, including Viola Davis, are all in service to the king. So the idea that it's a film about emasculation and it, it emasculates men and men can't lead. There is a clear king in the film that is leading everyone, including these badass, strong, ferocious, dangerous soldiers that happen to be women. Can folks actually watch it? If anything, the underlying message when it comes to relationships in the film is about black people, a black man and women working in tandem to build a stronger society. It's not about women being in submission. It's not about the king being in in leadership and some do as I say. He actually respects his women warriors and he actually respects the mind of his general. Them working together creates a better, stronger, longer lasting kingdom. These crazed men and their pick me, I don't know, subservience. They came up with this message about what this film is and encouraged people to boycott it based on that message. And it's not even what the film's about. I think that's the part that got me. It's like, you know, like the color purple. Like I remember vaguely because I was really young when the color purple came out and there were so many black men who were up in arms about the color purple. I remember this particular episode of Oprah where everyone in the audience got up to shoop, shoop. And there was this man in the audience who refused to shoop because he said that the color purple was a terrible representation of black men. And I was like, well, you know, I didn't get it at the time. But, you know, the color purple, admittedly, is not the best representation of men. But I also think when you get a bunch of black women together and you start talking about their experiences with men, it's a real mixed bag. It's going to be a lot of negative stories. It's just it's the nature of how men treat women, not necessarily black men on black women, but men treat women. When women get together and talk about men, it's often not a positive picture. It's like black people getting together to talk about white folks. Like, are all of them bad? No. Are the stories that are about to be told good? No. But yeah, I'm just like, can you watch the damn movie before you make the critiques? And this is something that I have done before. I have misjudged things based on assumptions. So I'm admitting that I've made this mistake before as well. So I hope all the people that are running their mouths about Woman King, that thought it was one thing and it's turned out to be a whole nother. I hope you too have the, the grace to apologize and admit that you were wrong. And to also go tell all the people that you told to boycott the film on, on a non-existent premise. I hope you, you actually say that, you know what, I was wrong. And actually, you should go see this film. Because it's actually a really good film. It did $19 million despite calls for a boycott and despite all the misinformation about the film. It probably could have done so much better if it wasn't fighting an uphill battle with black people. It's like, you know how hard it is to get a black film made and then there's like black people out here objecting to it. And I totally would understand if it was something that was like, you know, buffoonery and was making the race look bad or something like that. But just it doesn't tell the true story of what happened. One, it's not a documentary. Two, the thing that you thought it didn't address, it did. The men that you thought were so emasculated weren't. I would be remiss if I did not mention Puerto Rico right now. I haven't seen a lot of news stories coming out of Puerto Rico, mostly because it's being hit by a hurricane. The entire island is without power. So even if folks are down in Puerto Rico doing their due diligence to report, they can't get the story out because there's no power. I watched a video earlier today on Baller Alert. It was a video of a bridge being washed away. I'm looking at the picture right now. I did a screenshot. I think it might have just been a security person. I don't see a a microphone or anything in the person's hand. But they're standing there on like, you know, by where you would, you know, essentially walk onto the bridge. And the water from the river was so high and so powerful that the bridge just washed away on video. Hurricane Fiona. I feel bad for Puerto Rico. I'm like, did, did they recover from their last, I guess, environmental event? I don't know if it was a hurricane, 
But I just remember this is not the first time in the last couple of years that Puerto Rico has been without power. I feel like they were just recovering from the last hurricane and now this. And meanwhile, somebody else pointed this out. The entirety of Puerto Rico is, is being hit by a hurricane and is out of power. But all the news stations are covering the queen's funeral. Like, with all due respect to the queen, she's dead. We can't help her. Puerto Rico, those people are alive for now. And they will stay that way if they get aid and help. The commentary I was reading, it was like, I need to remind people that Puerto Rico is a part of the United States. Like, we don't think of it as such. But Puerto Rico is, 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 is a U.S. territory. They count. They're part of us. Help Puerto Rico. Y'all covering the queen while a part of the U.S. is without power. That's... That's not okay. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn disruptive entrepreneurship with Richard Branson or the power of personal branding with Kris Jenner, self-expression and authenticity with RuPaul. With over 150 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. I started taking Masterclass maybe four years ago now. There were classes on writing for TV with Shonda Rhimes and Aaron Sorkin, two of the best writers in the business. I was blown away by the depth of knowledge and the quality of the experience. I loved it so much, I started watching random Masterclasses for things I wasn't even interested in until I did the Masterclass. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every class. And as a Ratchet and Respectable member, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash ratchet now. That's masterclass.com slash ratchet for 15% off Masterclass. Today's episode is brought to you by Honey Love. Ladies, let's talk about shapewear. We all know most shapewear makes you feel like you're suffocating. That sexy dress in the back of your closet is so freaking cute, but the thought of having your inside squished by your shapewear is just not worth it. That's why Honey Love spent years researching and developing effective shapewear that's actually comfortable. Overly tight, cheap, and sticky fabrics that roll up are a thing of the past. Thanks to Honey Love, you can finally feel confident and comfortable in your favorite outfits. We have an exclusive deal for our listeners. For a limited time only, you can get Honey Love's best deal they offer. Get 20% off your entire order with code RATCHET at HoneyLove.com. I've had so many bad experiences with shapewear. Have you ever had welts in your skin because your shapewear was too tight? Yikes! I never have to worry about that with Honey Love. Not only does it suck me in, it keeps me comfortable. Unlike other shapewear, Honey Love's best-selling superpower short has targeted compression technology that distinguishes between areas where you want more support and areas you need less compression. Their Signature X targets and sculpts your midsection without squeezing your natural curves. It's designed to work with your body, not against it. But it doesn't stop there. Honey Love has more than just sculpt wear. They have incredibly comfortable bras, tanks, and leggings for everyday support. No matter the occasion, you deserve to look and feel your absolute best. Get 20% off at honeylove.com with code RATCHET. Calling all my honeys. You deserve this. I've been watching, I have it written down as Game of Thrones. It's technically... House of the Dragon. But when I'm not referring to it as Game of Thrones, I just call it House of Dragons. HBO got to stop with this shit where they keep trying to like rename stuff that we're familiar with and they want to like rename it as something else entirely different. Sex in the City, they wanted to like bring the characters back and call it in just like that. Nobody's calling it in just like that. We're going to call it like the new Sex in the City. The same way with House of the Dragon. Like at best, you're going to get House of Dragons from me. But really, I just call it like the new GOT, but the prequel. I'm, I'm just now finally getting over how Game of Thrones ended. They could never do a spinoff from the actual Game of Thrones just because the way they ended it, it left such a sour taste. Like they had to do a prequel. If they wanted to keep the franchise going, they couldn't do anything that was a continuation because 
They bombed that ending. I'm still mad about the way Game of Thrones ended. That's not the point. The point is, I started watching House of Dragons, I guess it's a month ago now, because they're on episode five. Baby, baby, this show is good. It's really good. It took me a while to get into it. All the characters in House of Dragons seem like initially off-brand versions of characters we, we knew or liked or hated. P- take your pick from Game of Thrones. So it took me a minute to get into it. But episode five, like, oh, oh, OK, the story is rolling now. Like, there's plenty of dragons, not as many as you would think for a show like, you know, with dragons in the title. But they show up often enough. You don't really forget that they're there. But I was like, this is a soap opera for your ass. Like these people got problems on problems on problems. Somebody in my timeline commented the other day about the the royal family. And they were like, how do you have all this money and all this power and still have all these problems? Like, write new laws to get rid of your problems. Like, what the fuck? That's what I feel about House of Dragons. I'm like, but you're the king. Why do you have so many problems? Either kill these people or, like, rewrite the laws so that you have less problems. I don't understand. So many problems. But I don't want to give anything away. But if you're not watching House of Dragons, you should be. It's a really good show and a bunch of people about to die. Like, there's no way you can live through this. I've also been watching Handmaid's Tale. It came out the first two episodes. I think this is the final season, but the first two episodes came out on Hulu last week. June, crazy as shit. Understandably so. I mean, she has like extraordinary PTSD. But if someone had kept you captive, separated you from your family and then forced you to breed through bizarre Christian rituals, and then also forcibly raped you and then stole your baby. You would have issues too. I understand why June is crazed. I don't understand why Serena is crazed. Serena is June's nemesis on the show. If you haven't watched the show, you won't understand anything I'm talking about. This will all sound like gibberish. But Serena is like really, really crazed. Like like she has PTSD. Like terrible things have happened to her, which they have. In fairness, I mean, her husband cut off her pinky finger. That'll fuck you up. But also, this is the world that you designed, that you willfully, purposely, intentionally designed and wanted everyone to live in. You just didn't think you would be subjected to the rules that you created because you were a woman who created them. But once the men took over, they were like, who cares what you think? You have a vagina. Get out of here with that shit. June's crazy. Serena's crazy. June had been talked out of her crazy by the top of episode two. And then Serena was paranoid that June was like, was some June crazy because she recognizes like how crazy June can get. So Serena does this, this state funeral in Gilead, which I looked at it and was like, this chick has lost her mind. Her husband is a whole traitor, but she's out here dressed like Jackie Kennedy Like people told her your husband's a traitor and she was like, yeah, but he needs a funeral and here's why and blah, blah, blah. But this chick really went like full Jackie Kennedy. That's what I thought. Other people were like, yo, that's some real third right Hitler shit that she's on. Like the ceremony, the outfit. Serena's really lost her mind playing into like Hitler mythology. And I was like, was that Hitler? Because that really looks like, you know, the footage I've seen for JFK's funeral, like all the pomp and circumstance, like a a nation in mourning, like, like, you know, Serena, the, the ultimate grieving widow. She goes and gets June's daughter to, you know, participate in the ceremonies just to piss off June, which I was like, you already think June is crazy. You already think June is coming for your ass and you want to bring her daughter into this shit. The funny part is June was trying to like, leave it alone. Like, you know, build a new life in Canada I'm over Serena. I'm not going to go after her. Her husband and her bestie have finally gotten into her head and been like, you know, bring it down to a 10. Like, you know, focus on the beautiful life you have here. Nobody thought to get her therapy, though, which she desperately needs. But that's neither here nor there. But June had actually calmed down. And then Serena went and did that funeral. And June is now on a fucking warpath. I swear. I swear. I have watched Handmaid's Tale from the very beginning. I went and read the book. I watched the original film. I have very much invested in this show the same way I did with Game of Thrones. Like I went back for Game of Thrones and started reading like the books. Like I got really into Game of Thrones. If Handmaid's Tale blows this final season the way Game of Thrones did their final season, I will be pissed. I will be so absolutely pissed. If Serena does not get some sort of worthy killing in the way that her husband did, 
I will be pissed. Because Game of Thrones, crazy ass Cersei, who tortured everybody for all those years, she died. I want to say like some bricks fell on her ass. And I was like, no, 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 no. She needed to be tortured. She needed to be drawn and quartered. She needed to be burnt up by dragons. She needed a satisfactory tortured death. If Serena gets anything less than full torture, I mean, I want a whole 30 minutes of Serena being tortured for her shit that she has imposed on an entire nation of people. She deserves it. If that sounds evil, it is. But she deserves it. I'll be so disappointed if they don't give Serena her comeuppance at the end. Please, writers, please, please don't fail us on this one. Remember the bishop? The bishop that got robbed at the church in Brooklyn. One, I told you, I won't tell you the tales that I know. Um, and even if I did, I acknowledge at the time they were 20 year old tales. I am not the person I was 20 years ago. I do hope that the bishop is not the person that he was 20 years ago. He and his first wife and I were all in our early 20s at the time. So we were young, reckless, overindulging and pre-social media which has definitely changed to some degree the way that people act. I, I was also in contact with his ex-wife, my friend. Her stance on everything revolving the bishop is about like my stance on my ex-husband. He's my ex. I didn't, I didn't divorce him to keep hearing about him every day. They got to deal with each other because they have children together. But other than that, like she's like, that's, that's not me. Like I got a whole new husband and that's where my focus is. Thanks and come again. Okay. The bishop is back in the news. Not that he really ever left. He has been milking that 15 minutes of, of robbery fame, allegedly, alleged robbery. I woke up this morning and I had like, I don't know, 70 messages on my DMs. And I was like, what are people DMing me about? Um, every single one of the messages was about this video that's been circulating about the Brooklyn Bishop. That's what I've been calling him, the Brooklyn Bishop. Apparently, I don't know if it was this weekend or last weekend, I'm going to imagine it was the most recent Sunday. He was having church. He was doing his live stream. There were about 70 people watching the live stream. I know his church is in a small storefront in Brooklyn. It was alleged to have 30 to 40 members. Some women entered the church and were disrupting the church service. And they were yelling. You could hear it on the video. The camera is trained just like it was um, during the robbery. You can't see the congregation or anywhere else in the church. Just the bishop on, I guess stage is probably a better word for it. For it. He just has a stage and like a speaker stand. But there are women in the background and, he's a, and they're making noise and the bishop is addressing them. And as the women get louder, I, you can't hear what they're saying because the bishop starts speaking in what sounds like tongues. Like he's just making a series of, of loud, indecipherable noises. I was raised in the church. My understanding of speaking in tongues, like when it's really like biblical from God, there will somebody will speak in tongues, but it only counts if there's an interpreter. Like God won't have you speak in tongues if there's no one there to interpret the word of God. I don't remember what Bible verse that is, but that's how the Baptist church I was raised in, how I was taught that speaking in tongues occurs. I've never seen anybody speak in tongues in front of me, but the bishop starts speaking in tongues. It sounds like he's just trying to make noise to silence the women. And again, I have no idea what they were saying, what their, what their protest was. Um, but he's telling security to take the women, to remove the women from the church. And the women, at least one of them, make their way to the front of the congregation. And this is all on video. The bishop approaches one of the women and he grabs her by the back of the neck. It's very violent. With his hand still on the back of her neck, he pushes her someplace off camera. He, he says, I'm not going to editorialize on this. I'm just going to tell you the facts. But he says that the woman was approaching his family. And he, he says that, you know, that the robbers came in the church and they stuck a gun in his daughter's face, his eight-month-old daughter. And he said this woman was approaching his family and that's why he grabbed her by the back of the neck. And he said any reverend would, any bishop would, any man would protect his family. He got one job and that's it. So many people sent me this video. 
I watched it on several different sites. I read the comments to see what people were feeling. Overwhelmingly, people are like, what kind of man of God does that? What kind of man strikes a woman? What kind of man puts his hands on the woman? I'm only mentioning it because it's viral right now and a lot of people are speaking about it. I would prefer to hold my commentary on it until other footage from the church comes out. I don't know that I can necessarily condemn him based off that video alone. Of course, I don't condone men laying hands on women, which is exactly what he did in that video. However, 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 I think context does matter. If what he alleges is the woman who came to the front of the church, if she was headed in the direction of his wife or in the direction of his child, I completely understand why he would react like that. Just and in my head, I'm just thinking about it like this. Somebody comes into your church and makes a disruption and they keep proceeding towards the front of the church. The woman comes to the front of the church and again, all on video, she walks past the bishop and she's headed to someone to the right of the camera. I don't know who that is because again, the camera's only chained, only trained on the bishop and his, his microphone stand. So you can't see who's off camera. But the woman is bypassing him. She's not coming to confront him. She's going towards someone else. And, you know, she looks fired up in the video. Did she have the intent to be violent? Did she have the intent to just make a disruption? She was just going to, like, you know, raise some hell, make some noise, tell some tales, tell people about themselves, reveal some truths. I don't know. Um, But I don't know who was sitting right there off camera. It could have been his wife and kid. It could have been an empty chair. Because admittedly, like after the, the people, after the women were escorted out, the bishop was like, you know, he said something like, he's like, clap for the Lord, a round of applause for the word of God. And I was like, I ain't hear nobody clapping. And I was like, is this man sitting in there by himself? Are there other people in there? Because I ain't hear no one clapping. And I was like, does this man have a congregation? Is there anybody in that church? I don't know. I would like to see the video from somebody else's angle. I ain't hear nobody clapping. But allegedly his church does have members. And I can't imagine that that all this commotion happened in a church and nobody whipped out their cell phone. Nobody. I find that very unlikely in the year of our Lord 2022. So I would like to reserve commentary until whatever congregants may have been present, if any were. I would like to reserve my commentary until that video comes out. Because if it comes out that, you know, that these women were like approaching his family, I can see him stopping that. I can see him laying hands on somebody, man, woman, child, to stop somebody from harming his family. I can see it. Again, I don't like to justify, you know, a man laying hands on a woman. I would like to hope if there was a man in my presence who gave a damn about me, he would stop that before somebody got to me. Now, if that man was sitting up in that room by himself with no congregants, and that lady was just, just marching around the room and he laid hands on her because she blocked his camera shot. Then that mofo need to go to jail because that's some crazy shit. But I don't know. I don't know. I need to see where the lady was walking and who she was walking to, if anybody, before I can make a call on that. I know people won't like that perspective. I know folks want like to just automatically condemn him, but I can't. That's that weird fairness gene in me. I like to um, I like to give folks kind of the benefit of the doubt on some shit. Nor knows he doesn't really deserve the benefit of the doubt. But he immediately said the woman was walking toward my wife and kid. And so he did what any pastor, bishop, father would do, which was protect his child, which. I mean, as a father, you got one job. Maybe he fulfilled it in grabbing that lady by the neck. I don't know. We'll see. I wait for the video to come out because I know it's coming. Holy Twitter never fails to activate. I'm sure there'll be video within the next 48 hours. We can probably address this on the next episode based on the video footage. Is there anything else we need to talk about this week? The Woman King, Puerto Rico, Handmaid's Tale. No, I think we're good. I'm sure this is not everything, but this is enough. We done good today. All right. I'll be back Friday with more. Talk soon. Bye. Thank you.